Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so called experts get it wrong. This week, we commemorate the 30th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster in Ukraine with a nuclear hot seat special. We'll hear from Chernobyl survivor Bonnie Kunova, who was a teenager in Bulgaria when the accident happened, and she'll tell us about the impact that disaster had on her and her not yet born children. From Dr. Timothy Mousseau on his research into mutations in Chernobyl's insects, birds, and small mammals. From Dr. Janet Sherman, who edited the English translation of Dr. Alexei Yablokov's groundbreaking book, Chernobyl Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment. A brief interview with Dr. Yablokov himself on the need for independent international testing of all nuclear facilities. And Voices from Japan makes a Chernobyl Fukushima connection with a message from Ryuichi Hirokawa. A Japanese journalist who is not only the first non Soviet photojournalist allowed at Chernobyl, but who began working at Fukushima the day after that disaster began. Today is Tuesday, April 26, 2016, and here is the nuclear hot seat Chernobyl 30th anniversary special. The Chernobyl nuclear power plant in Ukraine, in the Soviet Union, Was the site of a catastrophic nuclear accident on April 26, 1986. An explosion and fire released massive quantities of radioactive particles into the atmosphere, where they spread over much of the western USSR and Europe. Radioactive particles from Chernobyl still circle the Earth as part of the jet stream, where it continues to be brought down to Earth by rain and snow. The story of the accident and what it took to encase the Chernobyl facility in the first sarcophagus was told in chilling detail in the film The Battle for Chernobyl. The film is available on YouTube and we'll have it up on the website nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 253. To create a more personal picture of Chernobyl's lasting effects on people and the environment, I spoke with Bonnie Kunova. She was a 16 year old living in Sofia, Bulgaria, about 800 miles away from Chernobyl, when the accident began in 1986. She currently lives in the United States with her husband and three children. When Chernobyl happened on April 26th of 1986, where were you living? I was living in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria. Bulgaria is a small country in the Balkan Peninsula, and typically on the maps of the Chernobyl fallout, it's uh, uh, colored in gray, like it wasn't uh, affected. Unfortunately, the reason for that is because the government never allowed any tests and never any data has been released about the impact, but the impact definitely has been devastating. You were living in Bulgaria. What, if anything, did you learn about Chernobyl when it happened? When it happened,、uh, nobody of the ordinary people knew anything about it. It was kept as a deep secret as the communist government at that time felt obligated to be loyal to the Soviet Union powers that be. And, of course, Soviet Union couldn't do anything wrong or make any mistake. Therefore, there was nothing going on. And then,、uh, not only we weren't told, but when there were some whispers in the Air, the government, Bulgarian government, officially went on national TV and declared that there's no problem and we can eat、uh, spinach and lettuce and drink milk and be outside. And we actually mandatory, we, I was a、uh, teenage girl at that time, were forced to march in a, some communist rally on、uh, exactly the same day when there was a, a rain that was dragging down the nuclear、uh, hot particles and basically the nuclear rain was raining upon us. How soon after it happened did you start hearing the whispers that something was wrong? Basically, besides occasional whisper, nothing really was declared until the fall of the communism in、uh, 1989. So it was three, three years. years and a half, yeah. During that time, were people aware of any changes either in the food or in health or in children? People observed、uh, numerous changes. The 
plants that spring all looked burned and uh, yellow and gray and uh, brown. Some of the um, annual vegetables, especially the most sensitive, like spinach and lettuce I mentioned, were also brown and, and um, dead, some of them. Some of them just um, looking strange. Some of the um, lettuces actually grew huge, like three, four size times bigger than the usual size. The next few summers, I actually was working in a farming community, and I heard from local farmers that they have observed strange changes in their baby animals. Every spring, all of them have their baby goats and sheep and cows and horses, and then they had an um, amazingly high number of animals, either stillborn, born with organs and um, limbs that are like multiple numbers, like five legs or two heads or just like missing parts. I actually remember particularly in 1988, I worked a little bit longer, so uh, it happened that my birthday in September was... Uh, I was still working there, and the farmers were so sweet, they wanted to throw a party for me, and they actually killed a baby goat, and that goat had sex organs for female and male. And if that was a novel, that would be foreshadowing of the future problems, because I heard from a scientist that the different creatures have different time of responding to radiation, and the more primitive or simple organisms uh, mutate faster, obviously. At that time, I heard from a scientist that they expect the peak in the mutations in humans to occur 10 years after Chernobyl, which was exactly when my son was born. But apparently that even wasn't the, the most dramatic peak because according to the recent statistics, the problems and the mutations continue even in a worse way year after year. So we really don't know when the peak will be. How were babies affected by this? The babies that were born at that time had bone problems, skin problems, uh, respiratory problems. You were talking before, uh, before we did the interview, you mentioned about a child that you knew who was born three days after Chernobyl happened. Yeah, that was my doctor. My son's doctor daughter was born three days after Chernobyl. And even that doctor who was a medical personnel and very intelligent woman wasn't aware of what's going on. So she was exposing her daughter to the son, which is traditional for the area and then her this is part of the health for giving the baby yes, vitamin especially D especially that um, winter time in Bulgaria is dark and cold so you do need that exposure yes her her daughter's bones were literally melted and she needed support for the rest of her life her um, bones after. were melted yeah they she they were so soft that they couldn't support her body ever and she survived? She survived with normal, uh, otherwise intelligent girl, but um, disabled for, for life. Did the government continue to deny that there Absolutely. was anything wrong? Absolutely. The government continued to deny. There was no comment at all. The food wasn't uh, withheld, so people actually were encouraged to eat uh, food that was definitely contaminated. While later on uh, in the uh, investigation, it turned out that the government itself had deliveries with charter airplanes from New Zealand, special food for their, them and their families, and their families were in sh underground shelters. But uh, the ordinary people were actually sent to march on the streets for rallies and get all the exposure that was at that time the strongest at its peak. So, no, there was no officially released any information besides the talk among people and um, lots of jokes. Bulgarians like to joke on political topics. Tell me some Chernobyl jokes. Grandson is asking his grandfather, hey, da uh, grandpa, tell me what, uh, what was it in Chernobyl at that time? And the grandfather answers, oh, nothing, nothing much, don't worry about it, and pat his uh, grandson on both of his heads. <laughs> yeah, I know it's bad. <laughs> we shouldn't laugh, but it's... <laughs> so, yeah, the grandson got two heads. <laughs> so, and unfortunately, that's the reality for that area. Uh, if you look at any documentary, you can see children with tumors as big as their heads or organs outside of their bodies. And unfortunately, it doesn't get better. If you look at the data for Russia and Ukraine and all these areas that were affected, uh, still, it doesn't get better. Still, people have all of these problems. Talk to me about what happened with your son. 
When I turned uh, 24, I got pregnant. My husband at that time was also a mountaineer and uh, outdoor man, and he was exposed to the Chernobyl radiation even in a closer proximity to the explosion. And I was marching in that communist rally <laughs> that was mandatory, unfortunately. You couldn't sneak out unless you wanted to get in a serious trouble. I was uh, young and healthy. I have no history of genetic uh, diseases in our family. Same with my ex-husband. But um, our son was born and immediately diagnosed with Down syndrome. And uh, the day he was born, uh, there were 42 or 3 kids in the hospital. Three out of them were Down syndrome kids, which is extremely high ratio of Down syndrome for the normal population. Right, the normal percentage is those, what? Those are all young mothers. For that age group, the normal uh, ratio, I believe, is 1 in 3,000 something like that. And Bulgaria used to be a clean country and actually was pretty low genetic uh, diseases. At that time, uh, with my son, there were three more babies in the hospital uh, with Down syndrome. Uh, that was a huge tragedy for all these uh, people because on the top of it, the country wasn't prepared. There was no such frequency of problems, mental problems or genetic problems. So there was no system of support, uh, no services available for them. And uh, these kids were really, really victims. So what is it that has shown up in your son? Well, uh, he is uh, severely mentally retarded. He has heart defect and uh, other problems that are related to the uh, genetic disease like weak muscles, weak joints, uh, blood problems, stomach problems. Also, I'm diagnosed with thyroid problems, immune problems. Once in a while, tumors here and there, which are pretty benign, but all of this actually, according to doctors, is linked to the exposure to radiation because there's no history of any of it uh, in our family. And I'm a pretty healthy person. I also was a uh, mountaineer. So all of these problems actually, uh, according to the uh, medical authorities, are linked to Chernobyl, and actually my son officially is labeled as environmental case by the governmental workers who actually try to get support for these kids. Even before I got a son with Down syndrome, I was very dedicated to the environmental movement, and I was very aware that uh, we are not capable of controlling and using safely the nuclear power. So I was actually a fighter against it. We actually did um, protests every, every springtime, every 26th of um, April. We were giving black ribbons to the pedestrians in Sofia and we were doing protests. And there was actually pretty fun uh, rallies in which everybody was uh, dressed as a mutant. <laughs> so we were having fun with that. <laughs> but given a chance to tell people one thing, I want to uh, say this. I don't want to leave a message uh, about story about some strange girl with a Slavic accent who had an unpleasant experience with the bad communist government, got screwed, her son got screwed, and then she somehow managed to come to America and get a little bit better help for her and her son. That's all great, but that's not really what I want to say. The communist governments were evil and they were capable of lying, but they are not the only uh, government capable of lying. I'm afraid that in any situation, powers that be serve their buddies, the people with power and money. And if big money is involved in uh, developing uh, nuclear power in any country, the governments will cover for them, and they did cover, as we saw in the case of Fukushima. The information wasn't uh, released. We still don't know what kind of impact that horrible event will have. I feel for the Japanese people, and I know that it has had impact on America, too. So uh, since uh, Chernobyl, in uh, my country and in the whole area, the um, percentage of genetic diseases, stillborn babies miscarriages, cancer, tumors, uh, respiratory problems, thyroid problems, bone and blood problems are skyrocketing. It's epidemic. I talked to the director of the biggest, most uh, specialized hospital in Bulgaria who happened to be somebody I know. She said that miscarriages and genetic illnesses in Bulgaria are almost like considered like a flu, like something that almost everybody experiences, and this is not normal, and it's not okay, and it's not easy. I myself actually lost a baby uh, a few years ago, and this is a huge huge, huge uh, tragedy that uh, some people maybe never recover from. And we shouldn't uh, take it lightly. We shouldn't say, oh, that's the price for using nuclear energy. There are other uh, alternative sources of energy. We really don't need to play with that extremely dangerous 
energy that we really don't know how to control and how to store the waste. And it's just really something that we should leave alone. What are your thoughts about what's facing Japan as a result of Fukushima? I'm seriously concerned about what will happen in five or ten years with the kids who will be born at that time after Fukushima, the kids from parents who have been in the area or the little ones who already have been exposed. Are they going to develop all kinds of cancers, tumors, headaches, bleeding? We really don't know, and uh, I feel for them, and I worry about them, and I don't think that that's how we should treat our future, our kids, if, if, even if we are ready to play Russian roulette or Japanese roulette. <laughs> we should give the chance to our kids to actually have a safe environment and enjoy their lives without having to deal with tumors and cancers and, and fear and pain and disabilities, because even one kid growing with tumor or, like in case of my son, intellectual disability and um, heart defects, has huge impact. Their life is so much tougher and so much opportunities are taken away. It's like a curse upon them. They're, they're really robbed. This is a robbery officially imposed to them. And even one kid is too much if we're talking about impact of such a negative event. What about million kids? What about million people? I've been told that most of the people who participated in the original cleanup are already gone. Cleanup of Chernobyl. The cleanup of Chernobyl. What about the cleanup in uh, Fukushima? I know that they s basically sent people who were sent on a suicidal mission, people who knew that Basically, that's the end of them, and maybe they will really willing to sacrifice themselves. But why do we need to pay that price? We have alternatives. We have alternative sources of energy. We can learn to use less energy. We can learn to be less of a consumerist. There's options. We don't have to be slaves to the nuclear power and sell ourselves so cheap to such a dangerous business. That was Chernobyl survivor Bonnie Kunova. Professor Timothy Mousseau is an evolutionary biologist and faculty member of the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of South Carolina. Beginning in 1999, Professor Mousseau and his collaborators have explored the ecological, genetic, and evolutionary consequences of low-dose radiation in populations of plants, animals, and people inhabiting the Chernobyl region of Ukraine and Belarus. More recently, he initiated a second research program in Fukushima, Japan. This is an excerpt from our interview from Nuclear Hot Seat number 243, first posted on February 16, 2016. What were some of your early findings from Chernobyl? <laughs> the first visit uh, in 2000, we went out and found all of the barns, uh, the old dairy farms that we could find in and out of the zone. We, we snuck inside the zone at the time. At the time, the exclusion zone wasn't really as high security as it is now, and, and so it was easy to sort of zip in and zip out with nobody ever catching you. And so we, we found a, a number of the old dairy farms that still had barn swallows in them, inside the zone, outside the zone, as well as in areas a fair distance away that were much cleaner, less radioactive, and, and started catching all the birds we could catch. And the first discovery was quite striking. The uh, Many of the birds living inside the exclusion zone, or right on the border of the exclusion zone, had patches of little white feathers on them. You know, nothing nothing really striking, no three-headed monsters or anything like that. But these birds were extremely unusual. They were pale to begin with, but they also had these patches, what we've been calling partial albinos. There are other names for this phenomenon, but everybody sort of understands partial albinism when you say it. And this was much higher in the areas of high radiation. There are, there are a few birds in the cleaner areas that show this, but very, very few relative to the hot areas. So that was sort of the first observation. We came back each year to these same farms to follow these same birds. And the, the, the beauty of barn swallows is that they'll actually come back to the same barn, the same nest, as long as they're alive, once they start breeding. And so we put uh, little bands on their legs so we could actually track their survival from one year to the next. We could see how many eggs they were laying and how well their babies were doing. 
and uh, we could take a little blood from them so that we could look for genetic damage and, and antioxidant levels. And we, we figured out how to get a little sperm sample from the males so we could look at how, how well their reproductive materials performed. And all of this started to add up to an interesting story after a couple of years. First, we noticed that males in the more radioactive areas were showing sperm that was either deformed or not particularly active, uh, not particularly good at doing its job. That was the first sort of clue that fertility might be a, an issue for these birds. Then we started to notice that many of the birds had other strange abnormalities, physical abnormalities, tumors on their, their heads, tumors on their feet and on their rear ends and sometimes on their wings, just sort of abnormalities that you never see in a normal population. And so all of this kind of added up to the fact that these birds were not doing particularly well. They were living half as long as birds in clean areas. Uh, they were having fewer offspring. The male, as I said, the male fertility was lower. Uh, recently, we've also shown that they have higher levels of cataracts in their eyes. Uh, it's just a plethora of negative consequences of, of the exposure to radiation. That was the beginning of all of this. And you go back to Chernobyl still every year to do the updates on the bird population? You know, we do. We've been tracking the barn swallows every year. And, uh, you know, every year we try to add a little experiment to the pot so that we learn a little bit more about what might be going on. The fact that we've been doing it for 15 years straight, this will be the 16th year for these populations, gives us a lot of statistical power for the sorts of questions uh, we're interested in. Some some years we've been putting little dosimeters on the uh, the legs of these, these birds for the last four years. And so now we have a really good idea of, of how big a dose they're getting as they fly around. And, and that's never been documented before. We keep following these birds. But in 2004, 2003, 2004, we realized that barn swallows were great, but people, you know, had broader interests than just barn swallows. Well, what we realized actually was that there was this uh, growing interest in what was going on in the Chernobyl zone. We weren't just doing it to satisfy our own curiosity at that point. We realized that other folks were interested in, and the questions that we were getting were, that this is happening to the barn swallows, is it happening to the other birds? What's happening to the insects? What's happening to the mammals? And so we started to branch out into a few other areas. We brought in other experts from other universities to, to collaborate with to help us in, in some of the systems we had less experience with. And so now we've been working on the entire bird community. I guess three, four years ago, we added a group from Finland who are mammal specialists, small mammal specialists, and we've been trapping rodents in Chernobyl as well as in Fukushima and uh, learning an awful lot about other components of the ecosystem in the area. Any results that you can report as yet? One of the great things about working with you know some of the best scientists, some of the most accomplished scientists from around the world on these projects is that you know we're getting a lot done. We've published about 80 papers in the last 10, 11 years on Chernobyl and Fukushima and, and folks can go to my website and, and get them all. But the latest results we published a paper last week, actually, it came out. It was one of our first papers on the small mammals, the rodents of Chernobyl, where we document an increase in the rate of cataracts in the eyes of the females. And we published a paper on the birds of Chernobyl two or three years ago, showing, again, that the cataracts in the eyes were much higher levels in, in, in the more radioactive areas. Now we're seeing this also in the rodents. And so this provides substantial support for the hypothesis that, you know, this is the radiation that's causing this. Folks tend to, uh, you know, if they can, they will throw out some objections to some of these ideas. They'll suggest that it's not due to the radiation, it's due to something else. And they'll have a long list. But clearly, the more results we have that run in parallel uh, among different systems in Chernobyl, but also amongst the same systems in both Chernobyl and Fukushima, when we find the same kinds of results in both places, the only explanation that makes any sense is that it's the result of the radiation exposure. And so, so that's why we've invested so much into replicating uh, most of our Chernobyl work in as much as we can in Fukushima as well over the last five years now. Dr. Timothy Mousseau. I'll have a link up to our full interview from Nuclear Hot Seat under this episode, number 253. 
Before we continue, I want to remind you that Nuclear Hot Seat is dependent upon your donations to keep us in production. If you have ever considered donating to this program and you find yourself being touched, moved, educated, and or enraged by what you're hearing, now would be a perfect time to help us keep getting the word out. On our website, NuclearHotSeat.com, you'll find a secure link to donate via PayPal. Just hit the big red Donate button and follow the trail of breadcrumbs. Know that whatever you can do to help, we are extremely grateful. Dr. Janet Sherman is well known for her work with epidemiologist Joseph Mangano on analyses of data after Fukushima that indicated a spike in U.S. infant mortality and hypothyroidism. She also edited the English translation of Alexei Yablokov's groundbreaking book, Chernobyl, Consequences of the Catastrophe for People and the Environment, which translated more than 5,000 articles published around the world on the impact of that disaster. This interview with Dr. Sherman was originally from Nuclear Hot Seat in April of 2013. A lot of people have saying that we've, uh, when we talk about Chernobyl and Fukushima, that we're scaring people. And I say, but you know, not everything was tested. Domestic and wild animals, fish, birds, trees, plants, fungi, insects, everything were tested. Many, many things were tested. And all of them showed in adverse effects after Chernobyl. And none of them are sitting on a psychiatrist's couch, you know. So it's not psychological when no. there are mutations in butterflies and animals and there's radiation showing up in the boars and things like that. Yes, that's correct. And also, uh, my colleague Tim Mousseau has been to Chernobyl about 25 or 30 times, and he's been to Fukushima a number of times, and they're finding the same changes in the birds and the in insects and the trees in Fukushima as they are finding in Chernobyl. They, too, are not sitting on a psychiatrist's couch, so we know that these changes are real, and they're persistent. In terms of Chernobyl, what are some of the changes? Certainly there was catastrophic exposure in the early days, but as it has progressed, what has been showing up now that we are, what is it, 27 years now away from right. the anniversary of it having happened? In Belarus, one of the biggest concerns is 80% of the children are not considered well. How do they define not well? Well, of various immunological problems, respiratory problems, birth defects, low IQ. And now this is, would be, you know, if some woman was pregnant during Chernobyl, this would be going into the third generation. You know, this is, would be a grandmother, you know, if she was like 25. Now we're talking about probably a third generation that is, that is uh, damaged as a result of, and in Belarus, which is, you know, having a terrible time, and economically it's in tough straits. So the impact genetically was not only on the first generation that got exposed to it, but you're saying that these are permanent mutations that have happened or genetic changes that have happened that are being passed down through the generations in Belarus. Well, not only in Belarus, but other places as well. I think somebody did, I can't remember who the, the researcher was, did 20-some generations of uh, wild voles, V-O-L-E-S, those little creatures that look like a, a mouse, and they found that the genetic changes were uh, permanent throughout all 20 generations. I've wondered, with the genetic impact, if there are 20 generations of voles, they've just changed a little bit maybe they've adapted to it is such a thing possible adaptation to the radiation well there are people who think that there is such a thing but i don't really know i don't think so how does the research that's been done on chernobyl relate to japan is it really a vision of what they are facing as a result of fukushima is it worse in japan is it happening more quickly or more slowly there Biology, chemistry, and physics are pretty fixed. If you look at the periodic table of elements, and you know that strontium-90 is being released, and you know it's in the same category as calcium, you know it's going to go to the teeth and bones. If you look at cesium-137, it's in the same family as potassium, and it goes to all the muscles and the glands, 
So it's not a surprise that these elements will have an adverse effect on living creatures, whether it's a plant, an animal, or a human. You can't change biology, and we know that it takes a certain period of time for an isotope to dissipate. It takes approximately 10 half-lives. So if you're talking about strontium-90 and cesium-137, they're about 30 years half-life. So you're talking about three centuries, 10 times three, that's three centuries. And these, this is immutable. This is, these are things that you simply cannot change. We know these things, and we've known them since the 40s. This is not new information. To say that, well, we really don't know what's going to happen in Fukushima is somehow or other either wishful thinking or trying to fool the public because once these isotopes are released, there's no getting them back. In terms of the human genetic damage that has been taking place, does it get worse through the generations? Is there any way to recover from it? I doubt it. We do know, for instance, that the children born to the men and women who worked as, quote, liquidators, they were the people who cleaned, actually conscripted and brought in. There are over 700,000 of them. We know that the children born to these people turned out to be unhealthy. Many simply just died. And there were a high number of miscarriages or abortions just as a result of the, the children were so defective. So is there a way to reverse it? I don't think so. Biology is, you know, pretty much progresses along a line. And it's hard to change it. For those who have survived, at least on the surface, from Chernobyl, mm -hmm. does it look like there will be long-term survival? I mean, what we're facing here, I mean, this is existential, but it's also true that with radiation and with the long life of it and with its impact, it does seem as though what we're dealing with is the potential of certainly a change in the nature of life on Earth, if not a potential ending for it. Does it look like the people who have been impacted by radiation are going to be able to survive in the long run through the generations, or are we a piece of biological machinery that's in the process of wearing down to zero. Well, I hate to say it, but I think you're, you're it's correct. It is wearing down. And if you've got people who've got immunological abnormalities and kids who are born with either birth defects or hypothyroidism, as my associate Joe Mangano and I reported last month, these are people who are going to have to be on, the hypothyroid babies are going to have to be on thyroid medication the rest of their lives. So if you can't get the medication, you don't have the money, or you don't have the resources, or you don't know that you need it, then it's a disaster. Thinking that we can release large amounts of radiation into the biosphere and escape any harm is foolish. Whether it changes the wheat or the corn or you know, other plants, we don't know. But it may make things much harder to grow and we may be faced with very serious problems. I mean, what are you going to eat if you're in Japan and you rely on vegetables, which in around the Fukushima area was a very big agricultural area? And if you eat lots of fish and all the fish is contaminated, what are you going to eat? This is very, very serious concern. In terms of exposure to radiation, what is the biggest difference in relation to internal versus external exposure. Oh, that, of course, that is the critical one because the nuclear industry keeps saying, well, it's no more than flying across the country in a jet plane. But the whole issue is the taking into the body isotopes that go to various parts of the body, whether I-131 to the thyroid and cesium to soft tissue, including the breasts, and strontium-90 to the teeth and bones. This is the issue. Once they're in, taken into the body, they release, you know, alpha or beta particles and cause harm. Is there any way that we know of to remove radiation from the body once it has been taken in, either ingested or breathed in or come in through a cut or a wound? The only research that I know of was done after Chernobyl where they used apple pectin to decrease the levels of cesium-137. Now, whether they're doing this in Fukushima or not, I don't know. But it did seem to lower the levels of cesium-137. And getting children away from the milieu where they're 
eating contaminated food on a daily basis seems to help. Children were taken to the United States and other countries and seemed to improve when they were away for you know, six weeks or two months. They used a gamma measuring chair that the kids could sit in and measure the levels of gamma radiation that was mostly coming from the cesium. And they found that the kids' levels did decrease. But what do you do when you go back and you start eating the local food again? Is there any way known to remove the radiation from the food or from the water? Well, I understand that Japan has been trying to remove radiation from the water and then storing the water. And where they're putting the radiation they removed, I have no idea. But it turns out they're trying to store the water in plastic lined pools. And, of course, we know that that's not going to work very well. And it's now running out into the ocean. And we're finding that even fish and clams and seaweed off the coast of North America are contaminated. What, to your way of thinking, is the best way to protect ourselves? I think the only way to protect ourselves is we have to close these nuclear power plants. We've had, you know, the the meltdown of Chernobyl, then of Fukushima, which is still really, it hasn't stopped. It's still releasing enormous amounts of radiation. Uh, It was about four days after Fukushima happened when Alexei Yablokov, the senior author of the book Chernobyl, came to the United States and stayed with me for five days. And he said, quote, Fukushima is much worse than Chernobyl and because, you know, the country is small, the population is very concentrated, the Fukushima area was a major agricultural area, and there's no place to escape. Now, Ukraine was big, and it wasn't a major, you know, it was a big grain-growing area, but it wasn't a, a, small farms. He was here just before the Caldecott conference, and he said, there's going to be another meltdown. I said, where? He said, well, I don't know where, but there ha- just statistically speaking, just by chance, yes, there's going to be another meltdown. Now, there's about 400 reactors in the world and 100 in the United States. We don't know which one is going to go down, but just because of the age of these and the fact that accidents happen, it's going to be another one. And what are we going to do then? How did you come to work with Alexei Yablokov on the book, on this cornerstone book on Chernobyl? It's like everything in my life. It was by accident. It must be about 15 years ago, a friend of mine had heard Alexei speak in New York, and he said, Janet, you've got to meet this man. You've got to hear him speak because he's going to be in Washington next week. So I went to hear him speak, and it was stunning. I mean, he was was so interesting, and I went up and introduced myself and talked to him, and we got to, to visiting, and then we kept in touch And I think it was in 08 he came here and brought me the Chernobyl book in Russian, which, of course, I can't read Russian. And he said, we need to get this into English. And I kind of naively said, well, I can edit it. And I figured it would take me, you know, four or five months. Well, it took 14 months. And he said, we have no money. And I said, well, that's okay. You know, I'm retired and my husband has died, so I've got time to do something like this. So I did it. And that's how I happen to be the the editor, just by chance. And how has that book impacted the world? What is the importance of it to researchers, to medical personnel, to governments out there? There was, you know, an enormous criticism of the book by the nuclear industry as soon as it came out. Of course. But it encompasses over 5,000 articles written by researchers from all over the world. And it's the first time that literature that was published by people in Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine has been translated and available to English-speaking people. But there's articles in there from Greece and Israel and Germany, uh, Italy, Sweden, everywhere. I think the big thing is that it encompasses what has happened to so many species, not just humans, but so many species. You can't ignore the fact that this is worldwide, although concentrated more in Europe than it is in the United States or Canada. Now, here's a question that I've had for a long time, and that is that it seems that cancer used to be a relatively rare disease. 
but that since approximately the mid 40s and if we think 1945 from trinity through hiroshima and nagasaki those were the first atmospheric releases of nuclear radiation and the radionuclides. Since that time through the years, it seems that cancer has first been slowly growing in its rate and now exploding exponentially to the point where 41% of us are expected to get cancer in our lives. While it may seem to my naive and non-scientific eyes that there is a direct correlation, as a doctor, as somebody who is experienced in this, what for you is the correlation between the increase in radionuclides and the ever-expanding rate of cancer in the world? I think there's a direct relationship. We know that cancer is not randomly distributed in any population, none. A great deal of research has been done showing increase in cancer in proximity to nuclear power plants. A number of very good articles have been reported from Germany about children and leukemia in proximity to nuclear power plants in Germany. We also know that Busby's work shows an increase in cancer around the plants in the British Isles. My colleague Joe Mangano did a study of thyroid cancer in the United States. And men, women, Blacks and whites, the highest cancer rate for thyroid cancer in the United States. Guess where? You tell me. Eastern Pennsylvania. Yeah, downwind from Three Mile Island. Oh, my God. And southern uh, New Jersey. This is not data that we generated. This is governmental data. And the study that we just released on hypothyroidism in newborns in the United States is based on governmental data. We're using state and federal data. The federal government is doing nothing. The Congress, as we know, is probably never going to do anything. So we have people wringing their hands, dealing with sick family members, And we don't know everything that causes cancer, but we know a number of them we could do something about, and we do nothing about it. You know, this is stunning information. I mean, we're killing ourselves. Right. So if you had a message that you wanted to get out, I mean, your information is superb. You've been doing this for years. If you had a key message to put out, what would that be? Would be, say, to mobilize every neighborhood. I mean, it's it's useless right now, I think, to start petitioning Congress or the president or anything like that. I would say in your neighborhood, mobilize your neighborhood to close any nuclear power plant that's within 200 miles of where you live and get them closed down. And even when they're closed down, there's there's problems because you have fuel pools with these, quote, spent rods which, unless they're kept underwater, are going to catch fire and release massive quantities of radiation. You know, this needs to be closed down, but unless people speak up and march in the streets and scream and holler, I don't think anything will happen. How do we get the vote for women? We march in the streets. How do we get civil rights? We march in the streets. And how did we get the Vietnam War stopped? The only way is to get the citizenry involved, and most people are just passive and are not doing anything. Either that or they're so overwhelmed by the details of daily life that they don't have any extra energy to put to this invisible, though ultimately life-threatening, power source that is out there. You're absolutely right, particularly if you're taking care of a family member with cancer or a child with cancer. You're, you're, You're overwhelmed. And sometimes I just want to curl up in a ball, suck my thumb, and weep because I don't have any children, and that's the decision I made after Three Mile Island. But for the children who are out there, what kind of a future are we creating for them? What kind of a future do we have on the planet? And who are these people who think that by this short-term, greedy, irresponsible behavior they're going to have a future line as well. What makes them think that they're immune to the consequences? You're right. You're abs- I, don't, I don't get it. I mean, I really don't understand how people can, can do this. You know, there's the Hippocratic Oath that, that physicians take, and I took it years ago, first do no harm. And I think this, you know, if this were given to people who are managing the uh, nuclear plants and the whole industry, maybe they'd think differently about it. I don't know. But when you see such widespread damage worldwide 
I don't know how we can, as a human species, continue to even use nuclear power. We don't need it. It only provides about 20% of our power. If you fly across this country and you see all the flat roofs that you could put solar on, and then you, you don't have to deal with long-distance distribution lines, you can put it on the roof of a Walmart or a Safeway or any kind of a store, feed the power right down into the building, or wind, which is now becoming very useful, I don't see why we have to have a nuclear, except that it supports an enormous industry. And there's a tremendous amount of money there in that industry. And also it supports the military-industrial complex because it provides the raw material for the bombs. Exactly. Why are we exercised about Iraq building a nuclear power plant or North Korea having one? Well, because every nuclear power plant can produce the fuel to make a bomb. Ah, we are in such a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I know. That's why I'm saying people, if people want to do something, mobilize your neighborhood. Just mobilize people and say, we've got to stop this madness. Dr. Janet Sherman. The study on hypothyroidism in children born on the west coast of North America after Fukushima can be found on the Radiation and Public Health website, radiation.org. We'll also have a link up on our website on nuclearhotseat.com. I was honored to meet Dr. Alexei Yablokov at Dr. Helen Caldicott's Symposium on the Medical and Ecological Consequences of the Fukushima Nuclear Disaster, held in New York in March of 2013. Dr. Yablokov is a member of the Russian Academy of Science and was environmental advisor to the Russian President Yeltsin and to the Gorbachev administration, as well as the co-founder of Greenpeace Russia. Dr. Yablokov has a thick accent, but I encourage you to listen closely to this brief interview where he expresses the need for independent international testing of all nuclear power reactors, and he should know. Tell us briefly what you shared the audience about what Chernobyl has to tell us about Fukushima. Both Chernobyl and Fukushima became more clear. So if we count the consequences for public health, it looked like the existing norm and regulation, official norm and regulation, not enough to protect people from negative consequences of irradiation. It's a big question why. I try to explain, it. we have a lot of explanation why. Because it's impossible to catch all radionuclide. It's impossible to precisely estimate irradiation during first days, first hours, first weeks, when level of irradiation 100,000 million times less than it will be. But as a result, as a result of this, all of these difficulties, the existing norm, it existing safety regulation, it's not safety, it's not, not enough safety. This is the main lesson from Chernobyl, and the same, we have absolutely the same situation in uh, Fukushima. Also, it's impossible to trust official declaration. Official declaration and industry representative, their logic to diminish any consequences. So what we have to be answer for normal people, for society, we have no right, have no right to believe official declaration and have no right to believe, to trust industry. What consequences for society? It means that we need to create independent system for check radiation. Independent because we have now a lot of nuclear power plant all over the globe. It means that every country, every society situated around the nuclear power plant have to have some possibility for independent measurement, level of radiation. Japanese experience in Fukushima show that it's possible. It was impossible in Soviet time in Chernobyl because it's too secrecy, no money, so KGB, local KGB follows every people who, who measurement. But in Fukushima, society, Japanese society show that it's quite possible to organize independent from state, independent from industry system for monitoring of radiation. It's a key problem, maybe key problem 
for safety life even in the United States. Because, look, two years ago, some German scientist friend of mine showed that even normal working nuclear power plant in some part of year released much more radionuclide than it average report average. Average is a very dangerous. Average is the average temperature for hospital. It not protect person, not protect individual. We need monitoring every day because, for example, every nuclear power plant they expand nuclear fuel and put. And this, during this operation, normal release from nuclear enormous, enormous. But when it average for year. Nothing is dangerous, but it will be dangerous for people who happen just now, just in this, in this place, when uh, this uh, operation is released. So we need some independent monitoring. It's also a lesson from Chernobyl, a lesson from Fukushima. Dr. Alexei Yablokov. In the Nuclear Hot Seat ongoing series, Voices from Japan, we present uncensored messages from the people of Japan about the Fukushima nuclear disaster. Ryuichi Hirokawa was the first non-Soviet photojournalist to document the Chernobyl disaster. That's why, when the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster began on March 11 of 2011, he was among a small handful of independent journalists to head towards, not away from, that radioactive site the day after the earthquake and tsunami hit. He talks about his humanitarian efforts to help the children of Chernobyl and how what he learned there is now being put into practice to aid the children of Fukushima. I used to think that nuclear power was a peaceful, safe energy source that helped humanity. But then, in 1986, Chernobyl exploded. And in 1987, I began to research the issue. In 1989, I was the first non-Soviet journalist to enter the no-go zone. I was able to witness the true face of the disaster then. People didn't have food to eat. They were living in fear of illness, and animals were exhibiting all kinds of abnormalities. From the following year, Back in Japan, I started a humanitarian campaign for Chernobyl victims. I had heard that people were concerned about food safety. So the first thing I did was to send radiation measuring equipment for food. Next, I sent medical supplies. But the problem was so overwhelming that I realized we would have to concentrate our efforts somewhere. So I founded the Chernobyl Children's Fund, Japan, and focused on delivering aid to children. One of our projects was a recuperation program that enabled children from the disaster area to have fixed periods of rehabilitation. They could rebuild their immunity and strength in sanatoriums by eating safe, healthy food and relieving stress by having fun. We started the sanatorium program in 1990 to 92 after the local people sought our help. NGOs from Japan, Germany, and Belarus cooperated, and we have helped over 60,000 children since then. The program is about a month long, and our research shows that about 95% of participants have benefited from their stays. Another area of focus for us has been children affected by thyroid cancer. If you catch it early, thyroid cancer is usually not fatal. But I learned back then that the stalling tactics of the IAEA and various medical researchers caused many cases of thyroid cancer to go undetected until it was too late. So we built facilities where children could be screened to promote early detection and receive the medications they needed to take every day. We also invited these cancer victims to the sanatoriums for recuperation. When little girls grow up and become mothers, we have a program where they can come back together with their children to build their strength. 
Because of this experience, as soon as the Fukushima accident occurred, our first effort was to deliver food radiation monitoring equipment to affected areas. I have a magazine called Days Japan. I used it as a platform to fundraise, which enabled us to start six citizens' radiation monitoring centers in Fukushima Prefecture. At these centers, we have whole body counters, food radiation monitoring equipment, and independent thyroid screening. From our experience in Chernobyl, we believe that the best thing is to move children far away from the area. But if this is impossible, then it's best to try to build their immunity in recuperation centers. Presently, we have a year round sanatorium in Okinawa, which is the southernmost prefecture in Japan. We started in July 2012, and we have welcomed 22 cohorts so far. Sometimes, mothers of preschoolers accompany their kids. We hope that several year round facilities like this will be created all over Japan. It has been proven that recuperation is extremely important. Unfortunately, the government and industry have been pushing the idea that Fukushima is safe and that there's nothing to worry about. This kind of campaign makes it really hard to raise the funds needed to build sanatoriums. We learned in Chernobyl that the third and fourth year after the disaster were when the serious illnesses started to manifest themselves. And this is not the time to let our guard down. Please help us in any way possible. Ryuichi Hirakawa. The link to Hirakawa san's facility in Okinawa is kuminosato.net. And we will have a link up on our website under this episode, number 253. When you go there, click on the English tab for more information and a link to a YouTube slideshow. Here's today's final thought. A friend recently sent me a New York Times clip from July 25, 1986, just three months after Chernobyl began. It read A prominent Russian writer recently produced a tattered old Bible. And turned to the apocalypse. Listen, he said, this is incredible. And he read, And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as if it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers, and upon the fountains of waters, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters, because they were made bitter. Wormwood is a bitter wild herb used as a tonic in rural Russia. And the Ukrainian word for wormwood is Chernobyl. Chernobyl, wormwood, makes the waters bitter. And yes, radiation does make waters bitter. That's what Fukushima is doing to the Pacific Ocean, which is now, only five years after the nuclear disaster there began, Revealing unprecedented deaths of sea creatures up and down the revolutionary ladder. More bitterness results from the radiation induced mutations that lead to the children from Chernobyl who need lifelong care because of the horrible mutations that they suffered. And how bitter is the fearful legacy we all share of not knowing if life under the influence of nuclear radiation, nuclear technology, will ever right itself? If we will ever heal and not have to be so bitter. I don't believe in a devil, hellfire, or eternal damnation. I believe life responds to effort, energy, and intention. So I'm going to continue to attempt to instigate change, talking about nuclear issues, and trying to inspire people to action. I invite you to join me. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, April 26, 2016. Voices from Japan is a co production of Nuclear Hot Seat and Beverly Finlay Kaneko for Families for Safe Energy. Thanks to Harry Hart Brown for the awareness of Wormwood. And welcome to listeners of WGRN in Columbus, Ohio. 
You are the first of what will become many broadcast stations to carry Nuclear Hot Seat. We are always looking for other networks to connect with, so if you know of any, do let us know. This is Libby Halevi of Heartistry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call on repeated occasions. Now don't go back to sleep, please, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. <laughs> <laughs>